Hello, you're watching Islamabad today for ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rafiq Today, we're going to be speaking about education, pitfalls, and opportunities. I mean, all know that educational sectors in developing countries tend to face significant amount of challenges, whether it's funding, whether it's the ability to produce quality publications, and whether it's the ability to attract faculty from all across the world. I have with me Dr. Homa Bakai. She's an educationist, a practitioner, as well as somebody who appears on television and shares her insights on current affairs as well. Dr. Homa Bakai, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's start off with education, and we're going to be speaking about the pitfalls. We're going to be speaking about the opportunities in a while, but what about the pitfalls? When you, when you look at Pakistan's educational landscape at this point in time, what do you think are the main challenges that educationists such as yourself actually encounter? Well, frankly speaking, uh, I have spent about 20 plus years of my academic uh, career, so to say, with public sector universities, uh, two in fact, and now I am with a private sector university. And there is something that I've been saying for at least last five years, and that is that if Pakistan needs one emergency, uh, it is, uh, I'm sorry, if Pakistan needs one emergency, it is education emergency, and there's good reason for that. You see, we've, we've compartmentalized uh, education in, into saying what is the state of the higher education. You cannot have good higher education unless you have decent primary, secondary, and tertiary education. And then, of course, right. higher education, or research, or PhDs, or whatever. So the, the situation is, is critical because our school enrollment is low. And the fallout from schools is even higher. And uh, people don't realize this, but the economic constraints that Pakistan is struggling for and COVID has jeopardized the situation further. So a lot of students, young students, uh, in their mid-schools and lower secondary schools and higher secondary schools were taken out during COVID. At that time, studies tell us boys went back to schools, girls were held back. So once they stayed home in, during COVID, they never went back to school. To add to this, the economic crunch, crisis, strangulation further complicated the situation. And now people are actually pulling children out of schools. So what to talk of secondary education or tertiary education? But having said this, even the state of secondary tertiary education is in a, in a dire state for good reason. And I'm going to just share stats with you the predictions That's for great. turning around the predictions for turning around pakistan's education is that they should at least devote seven percent of the gdp to education that is what they say essentially uh, international organizations say that at least four percent should be devoted to education most civilized countries devote 4% or more to education, even in the developing world. In Pakistan, we devote 2% or less than 2% to education. Why do you think that's the case? And, and that is also not utilized. The case is fairly simple. I think it's not a, it's not a priority since the inception of Pakistan. Education okay. has not been a priority. There is lack of consistency of policy. It is seen more as a political tool than something to make the population skillful and give them tools of effort, social mobility. I think that is not even in the scheme of things because you see that the education is divided. You have the elite capture and they have everything, including access to 0.02% of English medium schools, which eventually prepares them for some good universities in Pakistan or perhaps admissions abroad. Or now Pakistan is experiencing a new thing, which is where a lot of Western universities, because of the economic crunch that they are facing, they're bringing down facilitation centers here in Pakistan, and the privileged will get access to have access to that and that they get foreign degrees. Uh, the, those who are educated or have acquired education have are actually choosing to leave Pakistan. The 2022 and 2023 are very uh, tough years for Pakistan because the brain drain has been tremendous. I think all of this reflects on how this neglected sector is now bringing down the state. And that is how I see it. Because if we want to actually be anywhere in the world today, or even if we want to compete with India, uh, my favorite sentence here is that 
uh, you know, wars in today's world are not fought on conventional fronts. They are fought on the economic front, on the diplomatic front, on the intellectual front. Or the educational front. And so that front. you need educational front, absolutely. So you, so you need educated population. We are one of the youngest countries in the world. 70% of our population is under 35 years of age. And while I thought I'm going to have this conversation with you, I thought I will quickly take a look at some of the figures which are there. And they are also not very pretty. For example, 25% of country's population is enrolled in higher education, if you call it higher education, 25%. Right. But having said this, they are unemployed, underemployed, or irrelevantly employed. And then I was looking at another labor survey, and what does it tell us? 37% of our youth, Pakistan, aged between 59, 15 to 29, are neither in education, nor in training, nor employed. Which means that 21.8 million people are just out That's there, not doing yeah. So that So it's a ticking bomb, and I think the figures are higher than this. Because uh, we don't count all our people. That's also one of the problems. Right, right, absolutely. So when we speak about the educational sector and higher education, I'm going to be speaking about, you know, the primary sector in a while. But when we talk about university rankings, for example, I mean, rankings can be very misleading but because it's all, always important to understand that the departments in which universities are actually excelling in, I mean, universities should be basically ranked upon that rather than the university as a whole. But we don't see a lot of Pakistani universities making it to the top rankings of the QS or Times Higher Education for that matter. Why do you think that's the case? Well, if you look at it, it I think it's ranks 15 higher education by QS ranking. No Pakistani university is in top 500. That's the mm -hmm. Times ranking. The universities that have some recognition uh, are perhaps Afghan University. Uh, in the medical sciences, Kaide Azam University, in the public sector, and Lums University in the private sector. These universities are fairly known to the international community, absolute, complete, entirely elite catch. Right. So the right. people who have access to these universities, except perhaps Kaide Azam University, are, are come from a section of the population which is not representative of Pakistan. But they control Pakistan. For example, LAM students are now opting for civil service, which means they are the policy makers of tomorrow. And they have a complete disconnect with what is happening on the ground. The same is the case of the what I call the Karachi grammar culture or the HSM culture. You see, okay. so this the small segment of population that has access to schools like HSN or goes to Karachi grammar, they have their own network, they pull at each other. And they control Pakistan, but they also have a serious disconnect with what is happening on the ground. You have huge sections of the population going to madrasas, which we have not been able to regularize, which we have not. You know, Musharraf tried um, to introduce modern education. It is on paper. It is not done on the ground. And basically, basically, it boils down to the fact that we don't allocate resources. Even today, we are opening more universities. It's it's a political slogan. It's, it sounds nice in political uh, processions, uh, saying that to people that more universities are coming to your uh, province. But at the end of the day, universities are serious business. University means good right. faculty. University means labs. University means libraries. Uh, university means trained academia. None of that is happening. And we are trying right. to do this in in a vacuum and it's collapsing. To me, the education sector in Pakistan is in a state of implosion. And unfortunately, we talk about economic turnaround, we talk about getting there. Uh, we we think of thing that SEPEC was take us there. When the yeah. when in this knowledge economy, so to say, how do you survive when education is not a priority? Even in our neighborhood, um, Hamza. Uh, if yeah. you look at India, 100% primary education enrollment. Bangladesh, 100% primary education enrollment. Sri Lanka, 100% primary education, well. enrollment. Lanka, primary education yeah. enrollment. We and Sri Lanka, by the way, also has a 91%, 91.7% absolutely. absolutely. Yes, we, we don't even have that. And then, of course, we struggle with elements of extremism. We, have, we struggle with extensive irregulated use of substance. Uh, there's, there's a collapse of governance and the academic governance perhaps is the weakest. 
Right, right, absolutely. And that, I mean, you know, these are these are staggering figures. Let me give you another staggering figure. If you take a look at the dropout ratio, uh, as far as primary education is concerned, or basically kids who are going to school, and then suddenly they decide to abort, they decide to, you know, get out of their uh, educational systems as well. Pakistan has one of the highest dropout ratios in the world. And the other countries are actually not doing economically all that well. Obviously, you have the economic powerhouse of Nigeria, but it also has a very high dropout rate. And then you also have Afghanistan as well. So how do you deal with this dropout uh, ratio and the dropout percentage? Because it is actually very staggering and something needs to be done about it. Hamza, I wish I had an answer to your question, except that my heart bleeds and I still don't see the focus required at the policy level, in the boardrooms, on decision-making tables to correct the course. I don't just see it there. The only thing that I hear is that they will do something for the optics. So some laptop, laptops will be giving out. Uh, they will announce new universities. And then, you, you know, this capital, uh, this, uh, the capital system has commodified education also. And yeah. with this modification of education, the fields that are projected as, as, uh, as to be pursued to get jobs is actually very, very, it, it inflicts more damage, if I may say so. For example, we do not encourage people to become scientists or engineers. We encourage them to do business degrees because it means that you can make a quick buck. But what are you well, going to sell unless you're not going to make anything? Then, of course, there is some now the new focus is on entrepreneurship. Even if the focus is on entrepreneurship, you need some hands-on practical experience. You need some sense of innovation. You need incubation centers. You need seed money. You have to have the, the capacity and the resilience to fail and to give your, give your students and give your youth the, the space to fail and then start again. We do not even give them a head start or we don't even give them, allow them to start off. So I don't understand how we are going to overcome this. You need, you need a multi-pronged strategy, a focus, and most importantly, and most importantly, allocation of resources. It's not I mean, going to happen unless you allocate resources. Very true, very true. Resources are basically the way forward as far as education is concerned. But if you take a look at the concept of ghost teachers and ghost schools, I mean, I was going through USA report where in Afghanistan, obviously, you know, it's kind of understandable. Um, and it's actually shocking that USA has not been able to provide the requisite educational infrastructure to Afghan students. But the dropout ratio, as well as ghost schools are pretty much prominent over there. But that's kind of understandable because it's a war-torn country overall. Pakistan does have restive areas, but I've seen ghost schools and ghost teachers even in rural areas of Punjab, which is supposed to be an economically prosperous uh, or comparatively economically prosperous province. So what do you do about, and why is there no accountability of ghost uh, schools and ghost teachers? Well, it's financially lucrative, this corruption. Mm -hmm. And it essentially means that if you're a ghost school, which a ghost teacher, if you're it's, it's a ghost school, you're getting money from your province. Right. For it. If you're a ghost teacher, you're getting a pay and you're employed elsewhere. So you're essentially having two pays. You will be surprised, Hamza, that a government teacher is paid more than a private school teacher. And there's zero accountability. So essentially, I think the way forward is that tangible evidence and the situation on the ground tells us that the state as a provider of education and even healthcare has failed. Right, right. And failed as has failed this has failed this fully. So I think the only way forward is public private partnership. I'm not saying it's the best option. All I'm saying is that the state should move back to the regulatory positions and be a watchdog and allow the public sector to come in and ensure that there is inclusivity. So I think. For, fund, for funding of a resource mobilization, we should be looking at uh, a voucher system. We should be looking at involving the parental community into 
or, or a community monitoring system. We should be looking at the private sector coming forward and adopting uh, public sector universities and public sector schools. And where it has happened, it has been a huge success. And even in the health sector, right? because I think education and health move together. Uh, Indus yeah, is, a huge, is a fantastic example. Uh, private initiative, catering to people, doing a tremendous job. Now the government approaching uh, Dr. Bari to take over some of the uh, institutions, both in Punjab and in Sim. I think the way forward for Pakistan, because of weak academic governance, the bureaucracy, the bloated, the bloated civil service and bureaucracy that is involved in all of this, the only way forward is perhaps to bring in the private sector, facilitate them, cut down on the bureaucracy and the red tapism that exists right now, and do it on a war footing. Like I said earlier, we need an emergency here. It's our future, it's our children. And it's a ticking bomb because if tomorrow then you have uh, what a nation drug addicts or people who are looking for options beyond this world where they think there's nothing that they have in this world, no tomorrows, nothing to look forward to, no future. Because what we're doing right now is that we're taking away hope from our youth and our children. They don't have a, they don't have hope. Now that's a very frightening scenario overall. We just had the Pakistan. It is, it is forum. frightening. Yeah. So Sorry. we just had the Pakistan Governance Forum just recently in 2023. Yes, I think a, it happened in Islamabad. I can turn up for that. Yes. Yeah. So I actually attended that forum, and there was this, um, you know, segment which was dealing with education. And the concept of, or, you know, the entire practice of attestation of degrees came about. Lots of students are actually suffering because of, you, you mentioned red tapism and the bloated public sector, which is preventing students from realizing their potential. It's almost as if a fresh college graduate or a fresh university graduate has to go to the inter-board uh, uh, certificate committee, the IBCC, just to get their attestation done. And then they also have to pay a certain amount of money to try and make sure that they can then get that HEC stamp to basically certify that their degree is genuine. Lots of students have been suffering because of that as well. So do you think that this entire, you know, I understand that fake degrees do exist in Pakistan and there's a need to attest genuine degrees and to actually attest the fact that there are people who, have, who are genuine, uh, genuine degree holders. But do you think that this entire, you could say, government intervention in the educational system is preventing students from realizing their true potential? And so this is a two-edged sword. Okay. Uh, there has been a mushrooming of universities where you have medical universities and dental colleges giving out degrees without an interface with the hospitals, without laboratories, you know, giving out masters in science without a laboratory. So the university, I mean, I think this was introduced with, with all good intention. And uh, the universities have been shut down. Whereas in the past, the practice was that they would enroll students and then tell the Higher Education Commission or the regulatory authorities, look, we have a body of a hundred thousand, we have a body of thousand students. What do we do with them? So you regularize us. And that allowed regularization of universities that were not universities at all. They were money-making entities, very, very commercial. And uh, you, because of the youth bulge that we have, opening up a university and promising hope, promising hope, promising tomorrow is a very lucrative business. So I don't think we can leave it entirely unregulated. I'm not saying this not this it, people don't suffer. I'm not saying there's corruption. I'm not saying there's weak governance. But we need to address that rather than completely eliminating it. Because I, for one, know that there are several universities that they open up in two, three, four, or five rooms. They enroll students with very poor faculty or no faculty. No questions asked on the qualification of the faculty. The faculty in these universities is paid less than probably primary school teachers. Yeah, yeah. So some regulation had to be introduced to ensure that the degrees that we churn out are at least worth the paper they're written on 
right now, some of the degrees that we are giving out are not even worth the paper they are written on. We are not imparting any skill. We are not imparting any knowledge. They don't know anything when they step out. I am sitting in this position. I have jobs. I do not have people who have the who have the skill to match those positions despite having a degree. And this is across the board. There is a, there are students who come and sit across me uh, here and I interview my students personally. And they have scores like 80% and 86% and I they can't speak two words articulately and I'm not saying in English and Urdu also. They yeah. can't write two sentences. And I don't know what to do them. I hate turning them away. But I know that they will not survive the degree. They will not survive an undergrad program. And that is why I say we do not have a magic wand to, to improve our higher education unless the focus is on secondary education and primary education. That's where you, and then, of course, have an alternative. Vocational training, skills, something that you do after high school and have a respectable career, have a respectable option in the society. And I think if we've stopped, we had that. We had a vocational metric and then we abolished it. Everybody wants to get into a public sector university at a subsidized rate, get a degree that's not worth anything and then come into a market with a degree that does not ensure anything. And, and one of the, one of the real indicators of the university strength is also publication. And when we talk about international publications, it's about ensuring that, you know, there are peer-reviewed impact factors. I know, again, uh, um, sorry, again, something done with very good intention. Okay. And turned, and turned into almost a racket. So if you're well-connected, if you know people, you will get your 10, 12, 15, 19 publications to get your promotions. And what if you're not well connected? And you might and be then you have, Sorry? What if you're not well connected and you might be I, brilliant? Sorry? And, and of course, there are elements of plagiarism. So I know people, if they, they will call up a journal and they'll say, okay, if you publish my paper, and they say, of course, we'll publish it. But only if you put the name of one of my professors as a co-author. So that he also gets a publication. And I am convinced that HEC is aware of all of this. And that is why the private sector universities are doing away with the uh, quantitative aspect of research. And they look at the qualitative aspect of research. I mean, if you produce five papers, which is actually added to the research construct to your field, then it's fine. Instead of producing 49, 50, 70, I don't know how many papers. Some of the CVs that I see are mind-boggling with a hundred and something papers churned out, which essentially means it's a copy-paste exercise. It is. And then they turned this into a requisite for promotions, which further harmed the situation because people are desperate to turn out 10 publications for associate professor and then 15 or 19 publications for a professor. And that's it. Nobody looks at the quality of those uh, papers, where they are published. And then because books, there is an element of favoritism, so they will not accept books. I mean, there is just, we've, we've, we've commodified everything. We've turned everything into something which is exploited by few to their advantage and the rest are left out and it has left them disillusioned. So we also have not very good people coming to the academia. And the entire sector and once again, suffers. Yeah. Yes, and once again, academia pays lower than other fields. So it does not attract the best. Very true, very true. So, Dr. Bakai, when we talk about, you mentioned one notable exception in the public sector, that's Fai Azam University. And obviously, you, you know, you served in the IBA in Karachi as well. Um, why do you think these two institutes stand out and what can other universities which are lagging behind learn from them? Fai Azam University, I am not in a position to comment. 
I know okay. I have friends in the Kaiser Azam University, but I don't know Kaiser Azam University from inside. But okay. I think RBA was one, it started small and wanted to remain small for a very long time. It was not one I, what I call on an expansion spree. And once, uh, once uh, IBA went on an expansion spree, is free maintenance of quality has been an issue. But more importantly, uh, despite being a public sector university, IBA had complete academic autonomy and independent board of governors. They were able to maintain merit, both in yeah. induction of faculty and in the induction of students. So this 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 autonomy this academic autonomy uh, allowed iba to function the way it did and it was able to create actually a very illustrious group of alumni that continues to help iba iba is an island of excellence but i think this excellence must proliferate and today the question is that is that excellence even at iba being maintained okay yeah, that's that's a very important consideration. What would your recommendations be for the public sector, uh, or for the government, uh, for the government to actually, you know, treat education as a priority? You mentioned it earlier, but what I'm trying to say is that the government encounters so many. I mean, just to be the devil's advocate, the government encounters so many different problems. They have a sovereign debt crisis to take care of. They have declining uh, foreign exchange reserves. They have constant tensions with India. And many would argue that, you know, the defense budget also needs to increase at the very same time. Um, there would be those who would say, yes, ideally, education should be invested in. And that is something that's going to define the future trajectory of Pakistan. But there would be those who would say that, well, you know, Pakistan is under so many different compulsions that they won't be able to legislate. They won't be able to treat education as a priority, which, again, is a, it was a, is a flawed argument. But there would be many who would actually be advocating for that. So what would your message be for those who actually advocate for the latter? Well, frankly speaking, I think we need to we need to actually sit down and see what we want to do in the next 20 years to our to our youth. One, a, a focus on primary and secondary education. Stop opening more public sector universities. You can't afford them. Consolidate the existing ones. Go into public private partnership. IB is IBA today because IBA completely outsourced its infrastructure to the private sector. And it was Dr. Ishrat Usain's personality that, that gave people the due comfort to invest in IBA's infrastructure, which then allowed its expansion. IB was catering to what the students in hundreds, now it's catering to thousands, but even, even now, way too small. I think the way forward is strong regulation, strong regulation and a public-private partnership. Subsidizing education is something the government cannot afford. They should create an alternative field, an alternative avenue of skill and educational training. There is a demand for our skilled educational workers in the international market. And there is a demand here. Our people who work on as mechanics, people who work on refrigeration, on air conditioning, usually do not have any formal training. They they learn it on the job. If we could give this these professions the due respect and the and the technology uh, sort of concept paradigm varnish, whatever that you'd like to call it, and give, then give them due respect in the society. I think that is the problem. We still don't respect the vocational training, people with skill. We are so obsessed with the degree thing. And I think Germany is doing it's a fantastic model. You have a choice. Yeah. Also, some of the Scandinavian countries as well. I mean, and I, I, I personally think that at the end of the day, uh, you know, we keep saying that we have so many challenges. There's India. India is India's invested in its education and its youth. And we need, Bangladesh has done it. And it's a matter of priority. You know, Bhutto Saab had said that hum bum banayenge chahe hum ghas khayenge. Yeah, just for our viewers, that basically means we will eat grass, but we will make the bomb, the nuclear bomb. We'll make that nuclear bomb. And we made it despite all the constraints and compulsions. We probably need to come down to a resolution where we'll say, come what may, we're going to educate our children. And unless we do that, we will come down as a state. 
Pakistan's survival is hinged upon how we treat our youth today. If it's taken with that kind of seriousness, I'm sure we'll find a way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Homa Bakai. Thank you so thank much you for joining me. Lovely to Likewise. Well, that was Dr. Homa Bakai. Thank you so much for watching this edition of Islamabad today on Hawaii. You can follow us on all of, all of our social media platforms for further updates. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.